Ako sa máme vid? A keď budete debatiť, ja budem s starom Gibinom, že nie je úsko, že sú to vid. Mega to je vid, že 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 Ես ակարդոտոշի խավոտ ես տումրատ ծարմումատ գենդեմի սոպտիր ծամետի կվեպնին դան, մատ շորիս բատոն եվ իրոմ լեվիս դրեսակ ձանդեմի են դա ինտերես տեմ կենտան շեղվետրիտ։ Մատի միզիտիս միզանի ամսոպտիո հետետի որգանիզատորի, մագրան դղես ամինդեկսի սավովարի չույն արգյքնել է, դղես սավովարի գյքնել է կապիտանիսմիս մորալ ուր ասպեկցեր, որ ես զետաց մողսեն ուաս գահակերտուս պատոնը տոմ պալմերի, պատային տոմ պալմերի ուսազրույս գարեթաց, դա մեմ վիկրոքոր ձալիան սա ինտերես ու լեկցիա իկնելա, մի արմին տխելով պիրադած մոսմեն եմի դա ուպավոլտիս դիսի ամանայի դուսում խոլնեն, իկրոր ես անչնավի լեկտորիա բատոնի Madhuba, that's all that George and you're going to hear from me, I'm afraid. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about a topic that I think should concern everyone who's a citizen, but even especially people who are considering going into business, whether it's a new business, entrepreneurship, information technology, agricultural business, or whatever. Because I want to talk about the morality of business enterprise. Now the book, uh, The Morality of Capitalism here, uh, has come out of a number of languages and the Georgian edition will be out shortly. Uh, the Armenian and Russian and Azerbaijani editions have been out, but Georgian will be out in less than a month. I have in English some other books you might wish to take. The price is zero. So if you want to take one, please help yourself. We have a few extras if you have a friend who would like one. <coughs> Now, this question about capitalism, I want to try to clarify, give us an opportunity to think about it in a systematic way. And to do that, it helps to have some discussion of just what is capitalism. Now, in the book, I discuss the history of the term capitalism. And we should remember it was not invented by people who liked the market. It was invented by Marxists, by communists, most importantly Werner Zombach, who was a student of Karl Marx, and he wrote Der Moderne Kapitalismus, Modern Capitalism, the first to use this term in its abstract formulation. Karl Marx had talked about capitalist system of production, and as you all know, he wasn't in favor of it. So one should be very cautious about words that are invented by the enemies of the system that they're trying to describe. Nonetheless, it became a common term. I'll try to describe a little bit of the confusion because it's used in different ways in different contexts. Let's look at some definitions of it as I'll be using it. We can start with Joseph Schumpeter, a very important economist. I'll talk a little bit more about him. He is, I think, underappreciated as an economic theorist in the 20th century. That subspecies of all the systems characterized by private property, which tells us he considered private property a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition for what he considered capitalism. Then he focused on it carries out new combinations of factors of production, we call that innovation, and involving the creation of credit. Joyce Appleby, a uh, historian at University of California, Los Angeles, has a very interesting book, came out two years ago, The Relentless Revolution, A History of Capitalism. And she focused on private initiatives using their own capital to sell something on the market for a profit. This is a very interesting history of business. I warn you, I think the economics is not very good. 
but as a history of business enterprise, it has a lot of useful information in it. Deirdre McCloskey was a very fine economist and uh, historian, talked about private property and free labor without central planning, that's a very important element, regulated by the rule of law and by ethical consensus. It's not lack of regulation, but the regulation comes about by the rule of law and by an ethical consensus. She also referred to it as the age of innovation, what characterizes the modern world. So we're accustomed to thinking of capitalism as an economic system, but it's much, much more. It is also, at a deeper level, a legal system. This is something we know more strongly than 30 years ago. People such as David Hume and others understood the importance of institutions of property and law to the functioning of an economy. But now, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Soviet states, we understand this issue better. I'll give you a simple example from a very humble man who is a great economist, Milton Friedman. When the Soviet Union was collapsing at the very end, there was discussion how to move to a market economy and the discussion of a 500 days plan to move from central planning, which had failed and collapsed, to market economy. And Friedman famously said, there are three things you must do in the Soviet Union. Privatize, privatize, and privatize. But years later, before his death, he recognized he had made a mistake. He was also a humble man. He said, we did not understand what was the nature of the problem. Privatized into what? There was effectively no legal system, no property law, no contract law, no judges and lawyers who could negotiate or adjudicate arrangements among persons. In effect, the Soviet Union did not have a legal system. It had a system of commands and orders but not law understood as a system of rules that allow people to coordinate their behavior. That was largely absent. What did exist was very informal. So people who lived in Soviet countries understood this, but it was not written down anywhere. I learned in Moscow, when you would go to a queue, a line, to wait for something, it was always longer than it looked. And the reason was, people would leave the queue to do something else. And people knew where they stood in the queue, so you could come back an hour later. There was a system of property rights that was customary. People understood this, but it was not formalized. They lacked the formal institutions <clears throat> of the rule of law. So the legal system is extremely important. That has to be gotten right. But there's another dimension also that has received even less attention, in my opinion, and that is the cultural and social system. That is to say, a culture and society that is regulated by a certain set of norms. As I mentioned, relentless innovation. Many people don't like that. And one of the reasons for some opposition to market economy is it introduces some changes. And this is, many people are hostile to that. In fact, if you consider Marx's critique of what he called capitalism, he was not morally offended by what he called exploitation. He thought it was a necessary feature of the world to accumulate capital. He found nothing immoral about that at all. What he did find immoral was change. He said, all that is sacred melts into air. Social relations of long standing are dissolved. Caste systems and class systems were just dissolved. And a new kind of social order was created in the world that had a new foundation. Equality of well-defined and legally secure rights and something new in the history of the world. The old liberal phrase, careers open to talent. That under this system of capitalism, Nothing was closed to you because you were a Jew, or you were Muslim, or you were from a certain caste, or you were of a certain birth. For most of human history, people did what their parents did. Their parents did what their parents did. On and on, marching into the past. 
but now a new social order in which you can create your own future. Careers were open to talent. That represented a new dynamic kind of social order. The erosion of aristocracy, of class-based systems, of slavery, and so on. That the most humble person could rise up and you could have what Vilfredo Pareto, the Italian economist, called a circulation of elites. People going from the bottom to the top and some from the top falling down instead of rigid class distinctions. The innovation is decentralized. It's taking place all around us. There's no ministry of innovation planning our future. It's happening everywhere. This computer here, my beautiful Macintosh, came from a company that was formed by social outcasts, what were called in modern American English nerds or geeks. These were young boys, teenagers who could not get dates. No girl wanted to go to a movie with these boys because they were so socially awkward. They spent all their time with computers and radios and fixing things. Well, today, those guys don't have big problems finding dates because they're billionaires. The market economy was able to change their social status because they were successful. They innovated in garages and in unexpected places and created some of the greatest companies in the world today. That has been going on now for about 250 years. This constant churning of innovation. It's happening every place, as we speak, not in any centralized way. Now, here's the interesting question why free market capitalism has a unique characteristic. Most innovations are bad ideas. Most genetic mutations are not helpful to an organism. Most new ideas are stupid. How do we know which ones are valuable and which ones not? One reason I find American elections annoying, every four years for president, you see the candidates running, and someone says, where are the new ideas? We want new ideas. I think that's very foolish. I like old ideas that work. Arithmetic, for example. I love arithmetic. I use it every day. I'm sure you do too. And it always works. It's thousands of years old. One and one is two. It's not 11. Right? <clears throat> seven and five is 12, not 75. It's an old idea that's very, very functional. When I find a new idea, I want the new idea that works, not just something that's new. How do we find that in free market capitalism? We have trial and error. You start a business, or you introduce a new product, and you see if people like it. Is it helpful to them? And we have a test called profit and loss. Profit and loss. Now, both of those are very important. I'll talk about why that is in a moment. If you add profit, if you make a profit in an honest transaction, you added value to the world. At least that amount of profit. In fact, a lot more because of what is called consumer surplus. If you make a loss, you paid 40,000 lari for the products. A profit is when you can sell it for 50,000 lari. You made 10,000 lari. You added value to the world. And the market rewards you and says, do more of that. But if you paid 40,000 lari, that's your cost of doing this business, and you can only sell it for 20,000 lari, you subtracted at least 20,000 lari from the world in value. It's a signal. You destroyed value. And it's a very effective one because it tells you don't do that anymore. Eventually you will run out of money. So we have a system in the market economy to determine which innovations are useful and which ones are not. Now, about profit and loss. I find that many times when I go and talk to people who say, I'm against capitalism. I went and talked to people who are in the Occupy Wall Street movement and so on. I said, what is it you don't like? And it always boiled down to the same thing. What they did not like was cronyism, not free market capitalism. Insider deals, and bailouts and subsidies for powerful, wealthy people. What we've started to create is not 
free market capitalism, but cronyism. A system in which if you make profits, you get to keep them. But if there's a loss, it's borne by the taxpayers. You get subsidized or bailed out. That's a very bad system. Private profits and socialized losses is an extremely toxic combination. And that's what we saw revealed in a very, very big way in the United States and some other countries. Now, cronyism is a feature of intervention. When the state has all these privileges to hand out, everyone wants to be the friend of the president or the prime minister or the minister of economics or the governor or the mayor or whomever. It pays. People will invest their resources to make that kind of connection rather than investing in producing new products and services. The term cronyism <clears throat> comes from chronios, meaning long term. And the key is the real alternative we face right now is not socialism versus capitalism. Socialism, in my opinion, is just dead. No one seriously proposes eliminating the market and substituting total central planning. No one wants to go live in North Korea. I can't imagine anybody. Or even Cuba. All of the traffic is out. None of it goes in. That dream is just over. The real alternative to free market capitalism is cronyism. It is a system of state interventionism to benefit one person at the expense of another. Cronyos, long term, it means the old buddies of those who have power. And those are the people who get the benefits, the rules are bent for them, they are given monopolies, and subsidies, and so on. That is the disease of cronyism. It's all over the world. Some countries have more than others. Switzerland has not very much, but I'm sure there's some. If you went and looked, you would find cronyism in Switzerland, and then other countries that have lots and lots more. Azerbaijan certainly comes to mind as a very crony-dominated economy because of the ruling family, the oil industry, and so on. And there's various positions in between. I'd like to share with you a little video from one of our Russian colleagues. Uh, in the book, uh, The Morality of Capitalism, is an essay by Leonid Nikonov uh, from Russia. And he talks about the issue of equality, free market capitalism and equality in the book. But let me share a little video he produced on this issue. Subtitled, if you have difficulty with his accent. You know, people in our country, in our region, suffered so long from lack of capitalism as the rest of the world benefited from it. We suffered from limitations and slavery, while others benefited from freedom and rights. What you have now in Russia is an improvement, sure, uh, over the horrors of socialism, but it is less free market capitalism than uh, you know, cronyism, a system of power and privileges. Free market capitalism means full equality before the law and no privileges for anyone. Free market capitalism is the key not only to widespread prosperity and social progress, but to human dignity. Uh, capitalism is the only economic system suited to the dignity of the human being. Economic logic uh, requires uh, free market capitalism. Yes, it is so, but even more so, it is required by morality. So the um, foundation of free market capitalism, what I want to explore for a moment, is fundamentally a moral one. Uh, some people argue, they say, well, it's not possible to talk about capitalism and morality in the same sentence. I think that's a fundamental mistake. There's a very deep, profound, and serious moral foundation to free market capitalist system. The belief that every human life matters, and a very radical claim uh, that's difficult for many people to understand. Other people don't belong to me. Everybody has their own purposes in life. Everyone in this room has his or her own life goals and plans, not to be controlled by another person. You shouldn't be subject to the tyranny of either a dictator or even a majority. 
but to be able to follow your own path. Your, your consent is required if you're going to do business with others. You cannot be forced to buy something. Now, free market capitalism rests on property. And this is a most interesting word in English and some other languages as well. I have no idea about Georgian. In English, it is related to the adjective proper. What is proper to you is your property. And that starts not only with your things in the world, this is a thing, but also, very importantly, your life, your own life, or as it was put in the old language, property in one's own person is fundamental. Second, related to that, property in your freedom. You have the right to live your own life. Your freedom is yours, to make what choices you want, not to be dictated by another. You don't need the permission of other people to lead your life or to live. And then third, what used to be called estate. In English, the word property has shrunk over the last couple of hundred years to mean only estate, your things. But the original meaning meant your life, your freedom, and your things, your house, and your farm, and your pencil, and so on. But let's focus briefly on estate. An efficient set of property rights is characterized by what we call the three Ds, make them easy to remember in English. The first one is it should be definable. That is, a legal system should help to define what is yours and what is mine. When you go to poor countries around the world, you find systematically a common feature. The legal system fails to define property. So people fight over water, land, grass for their cows, and sheep, and so on. So they're investing and fighting rather than cooperating because the legal system fails to define property rights. Second, it should be defendable. Now we defend our property in lots of ways. Not only the state. There are many ways we defend our property claims. Take a very simple example. If I were walking down the street in Tbilisi and someone came up and tried to take my suit from me, would I call the police? Probably not. It's too difficult. I would call on my own property defense system, which is this. This is very effective. Right? People don't take my stuff, generally because my defense system is quite effective system. We also invest in other things to defend our property, such as keys and locks. You have a lock on your door in your house. Why? Because people will try to get into your house and take your things. Or an ignition in your car. To start your car, you use a key. I lost my key for my car, and I learned how expensive these are. It's a really expensive part of a car. Why do we have that? It's because other people will try to take your car. So we invest a lot of resources in protecting our property. I was once one place where motorcycles did not have keys. Switzerland. People rode their motorcycle into the central village. They met their friends. They did various Swiss things that Swiss people do. And then they got back and they pushed a button that said start, and they drove off. That was amazing. They saved a lot of money on the keys, and it told me there are no thieves in these Swiss villages. Maybe there were a long time ago, and, and something very bad happened to them. But there are no thieves there now. But I would not do this in New York City, Paris, Rome, Tbilisi, and so on. This would be unwise. We spend money to protect our property. But more complex forms of property, like shares of a business enterprise, or a stream of revenue, someone owes you money from a loan, you cannot defend very effectively with this, with your fist, or with a key or a lock. For this we need courts of law, we need lawyers, and even sometimes we need the police to be able to defend our property. And then, what we find is, in poor countries, the legal system does not defend property. And even worse, sometimes the state is the biggest thief. 
what we call kleptocracy, the rule by thieves. And that's a very serious problem around the world and a major contributor to poverty. Finally, an old-fashioned English word, divestible. It means transferable, to be able to transfer it. And this should be done by the legal system at low cost. Everyone should have access to the legal system. It should be relatively inexpensive. I'll give you a simple example of two legal systems. One is fairly inexpensive, one is very expensive. It doesn't explain everything about the two countries, but it explains something. I learned in the country of Guatemala, it's a beautiful, lovely country, something quite interesting. In order to have a will, which is when you, if you say, when you die, you leave things to your family and to the church and so on, called last will and testament. You must have a lawyer, and they're very expensive in Guatemala. And the lawyer must prepare the will and put stamps and seals and ribbons, it's a very beautiful document on the will. But poor people can't afford that. If you're a poor person, you might have only $2,000 of assets, maybe, and the lawyer will cost $150. Think of that, that's a big percentage, just to make the will. So they die without wills. So their children are always fighting. Grandfather said, I should have that. No, he said, I should have that. Go to North America, Canada, United States. You want to make a will? It's easy. You go to a stationery shop. You buy a piece of paper. It says will. You fill it out. You get three people to sign it. These three here, one, two, three. And all you do is witness that I filled it out. That's all. You don't have to know me or know the contents. That's a legal will. You can take that afterwards and it will be upheld and respected by the courts. That costs about one dollar. Or you can go to willmaker.com and do it online for eighteen dollars. That's fairly easy. So in this respect you have an inexpensive open access legal system versus the Guatemalan system, which really is only accessible to the rich, and most people do not have access to it. So that tells us a little bit about the two, two countries. And then as corollaries, equality before the law, no special privileges based on your caste, or your race, or your language, your religion, or your political party, or anything of that sort. The presumption of liberty. This is a very important concept, and this little orange book on why liberty explores it. You should not have to go get permission from the state to exercise your freedom. If you want to sing a song, you don't have to go to the Ministry of Music and get a permit to sing a song. You can just sing. If you want to bake bread, you don't have to go to the Ministry of Baking for permission. Just bake the bread. There's a presumption you can do what you want, unless there is a reason to stop you. And the burden is on the one who would stop you. For instance, the singing might be so loud your neighbors cannot sleep at night. Or the baking might generate sparks that causes a fire in your neighborhood. Then there's a reason to stop you. But the burden is on the one who stops you, not on the person who exercises their freedom. And then this very important principle, the rule of law. One could talk about this a long time. I'll only say one thing. When you go to the court, the court asks two kinds of questions. What is the law and what are the facts? And not, what political party are you in? What religion are you in? Or what village you came from? It's the law that matters and not the personal characteristics of the parties to the law. Now, we think about property rights. These have been attacked by socialist-minded people. They say, we're for human rights, not property rights. But there's something silly and strange at the basis of that, because no one believes that this thing has rights. It's human beings who have rights over things. They are fundamentally human rights. As I mentioned, we think about life, liberty, and property. And John Locke made it very clear. He said, their lives, liberties, and estates, which I call by the general name property. So property means life, liberty, and estate. <clears throat> One of the 
important elements is it creates the foundation for social cooperation. I mentioned what rights are. Defined, defendable, and divestible, people can cooperate to achieve peacefully their mutual ends. So I like to pick this image of animals, even dogs and cats might be able to cooperate where they know what they may do and may not do. It also allows us to avoid the tragedy of the commons. This is a very serious problem around the world and one that we should focus on. And the solution is property rights. Let's take the case of fisheries, for example. If you go to the Philippines, sometimes the fishermen fish using dynamite or grenades. They use bombs. They throw that into the water. They blow up. And the fish are stunned, as you can imagine. And they float to the surface, so you catch them. If you, could, if you want, you could go to a local swimming pool and try this someday. It would have the same effect. <laughs> or they pour bleach, chemical, into the water. And the fish can't breathe, so they float to the surface. They can't get any oxygen. And you can catch them. The problem is it kills the coral reef. And the coral reef is a living animal. If it dies, there's no more fish. So the question is, why do you do that? And people ask the Philippine fishermen, why? Do you not understand? They said, no, we understand. We understand this very well. Why do you do that? And the answer is, if I don't catch the fish, somebody else will catch the fish. If I say, I won't catch fish, so there'll be fish tomorrow, someone else will catch that fish. There'll be no fish for me. Everyone has that incentive. And the consequence is overfishing, or in the case of the Philippines, destruction of the coral reef. It's a real catastrophe. And those countries that have effectively addressed it have addressed it with property rights. You can't do this with central planning effectively. I was in Namibia recently and saw something quite interesting. The lack of property rights was explained to be by farmers. Farmers understand property rights. Economists took a long time to understand what farmers know. If you don't allow private property, people will overuse the resource. And these Herero farmers in Namibia explained they didn't read and write, they don't speak any other languages, but they understood the issue. Everyone who comes of age can add more cows to the land. There are more cows than the land can sustain. And the consequence, they said, October, November, December, these three months, thousands of cows will die because of lack of food. And there's nothing they can do about it because they have no property rights. What they want is property rights. It allows you to conserve the resource. <clears throat> someone, if, if my cattle don't get the grass, someone else will. This was a quote from one of the farmers. And it is what you would find in a textbook of property rights economics. So these people should get Nobel Prizes for understanding how the world works. <clears throat> but there's more than just well-defined, defendable, legally transferable rights. There's also this cultural element that is very important and a bit hard to grasp. It's a culture of entrepreneurship, of people who are willing to do new things, and they know they won't be punished for doing something new. It's not like a caste system, where if a member of one caste does something else, they'll be punished or even killed. You can try new things. It's a culture of innovation, of service, adding value. Think about this strange feature. I remember going into Soviet stores, and you were treated very badly because you were irritating to them. They didn't want you to come into the shop. In restaurants, you would walk in, there would be 11 waiters against the wall, smoking. You'd come in, look for a table, and they wouldn't look at you. They didn't want your business. That's not the case in a privately owned for-profit business. There, they tend to, to want your, sir, your business, to offer you service, and they do something very strange. When you go into a store and you buy something, you say, thank you. And usually the merchant also says, 
Thank you. When you think about that, that's strange. You get a double thank you. Normally, if you help me, I say thank you. If I fall down and someone helps me up, I say thank you. But does that person say thank you to me? No. That would be strange. They say you're welcome. But in a market exchange, both parties say thank you. That should focus us on what's going on there. Mutual benefit. <clears throat> we have also our language, which has been largely poisoned by enemies of free market capitalism. And this quite systematically. As you know, in the Russian language, I don't know about Georgian, a lot of discourse and language was poisoned. For instance, the term spekulat, or businessman. These are, had negative connotations. They're cheating you, spekulat. Or, spekulat. sorry? Spekulat. Spekulat. There's something dirty about it, cheating. Similarly in English, though, as well. Think about some of these terms and what comes naturally to your mind. So if we think about competition. In English, the words that just come immediately to your mind from popular culture are dog eat dog and cutthroat. Now if we think about those images, dog eat dog means a dog eating another dog. So just think, a German shepherd eating a poodle. Put it in your mind. It's very unpleasant. We don't want to focus on that for very long. It's a, it's a horrible image. Or cutthroat. Cutthroat competition. Cutthroat means someone comes behind you with a razor, slashes my throat, and the front rows are covered in arterial blood. It's a horrible, violent image. So they say it's competition, which is violent, or cooperation. But think about competition in the market economy. We co compete in order to cooperate. Two companies, Dell Computer and Apple Computer, for example, competed with each other to do what? To cooperate with me. They wanted my business. So it's not that we have a competitive society or a cooperative society. It's competition for the sake of cooperating more efficiently and on better terms for the customer. If we think about exchange, it's greedy, it's selfish, these horrible ideas. All you want is the most money or the highest price or the lowest price if you're the buyer. But in fact, it's mutually beneficial. No one exchanges voluntarily to their own detriment. I learned this also very strongly in Guatemala at the university there, there's an economic anthropologist. And he made an offer to me once. I was there for two weeks teaching. He's Mayan, that is to say indigenous Indian person. He speaks Mayan languages plus Spanish plus English. And he said, I'm going to go visit my mother in the Mayan country, where Spanish is a real foreign language. Would you like to come with? <clears throat> and I said, yes. It was a really great experience for me. I saw a lot of things foreigners don't normally see from the local culture. But in the market in Chichi Castanango, I was bargaining with his translation for some goods with an indigenous or Indian merchant. And I turned to him and I said, you know, Estuardo, I feel bad now. And he said, why? I said, I've been bargaining with this merchant, this Indian businessman, and I realized it was over a dollar. And a dollar is not very much money to me. But to him, it's a lot of money for his business for that day. It's a lot of money. And Estuardo said, Tom, quick, sit down. He's a very good teacher. He said, sit down. So I sat down. He put his hand here. He said, you're sick. I said, what do you mean? He said, you have a socialist virus. You have a socialist infection in your mind. And I said, what is that? He said, like all the socialists, you think we indigenous people are stupid. You think we sell things at a loss to white people because we like you. He said, let me explain. If an Indian merchant says yes to a bargain, he made a profit. Or he would say no. And judging by your bargaining skills, he makes a very big profit, by the way. 
who was insulting my ability to bargain in the market. He then added one more thing, just to drive the lesson home. As I said, he's a very good teacher. He said, I'll tell you, if you were a bad person <coughs> and you wanted an Indian merchant to feel bad all day long, I'll tell you how to do it. Here's what you do. They say, how much is this? How much? And he says, that's 500 quetzales, the local money. Say, okay, and get out your money and pay it to him. For the rest of the day, he's going to do this. I could have asked for a thousand. He was a, such an idiot. I could have gotten a thousand quetzales. He said, he'll be upset all day long. But if you bargain and agree on 350, he made a profit. No one sells at a loss. <clears throat> Think about profit again. The words that come to mind in English because of movies and so on. Obscene, dirty, pornographic, or windfall. It means it just fell from the heavens. But what is a profit in an honest exchange? Not cronyism, but honest exchange. It's a measure of value added. You added value to the world. If you go into business and you make a profit honestly, you don't have to apologize to anyone. You did a good thing. You made the world more valuable. You were rewarded for it, but your customers were rewarded as well. Everybody was gaining from that. Now, thinking again about the market, some of the wisest things said, in my opinion, in the last century about economics were by this man, Joseph Schumpeter. He talked about creative destruction. And this phrase, I think, should be memorized by all economists. The problem that is usually being visualized is how capitalism administers existing structures, whereas the relevant problem is how it creates and destroys them. Constant creative destruction. So I'll give you a very simple example. <clears throat> when I was a boy, there was a career that I thought about. I might want to do that. Typewriter repairman. Everyone typed on typewriters. And there was a career you trained for to repair them. And I thought, I'd always have a job. Because everyone needs their typewriters to be repaired. So always be employed. You got to wear a very nice uniform, you went to the office, you repaired the typewriters. Every town had shops, typewriter repair shop. Bring your typewriter for repairs. There were typewriter factories. But there aren't any anymore. I haven't seen a typewriter repairman, I don't know, years and years and years. Or a typewriter repair shop. They're all gone. If you want to go see a typewriter, you can go to a museum and look at them. A friend of mine, about 10 years ago, when his son was only five, his son came to him and he said, Daddy, come look at this. I saw something strange. So what is it? It's a computer with no screen. <laughs> it was a typewriter. He said, how does it work? Where's the screen? Or another one whose daughter, when she first saw one, she said, oh, I understand. It's a printer that prints in real time. You type and it gives you the letter, right? That was all she could understand. She could only understand it in terms of a... That whole industry was gone. It doesn't exist. But it was replaced by something better. That. My beautiful computer. I like it a lot more. For example, I could never watch movies on my typewriter. I tried. I put the movie on the typewriter, nothing happened. If I talked to my typewriter, people would think I was crazy. I had to put a headphone in and connect it. But now I, type, I talk to my computer all the time. And there's other people who are in Germany and Brazil talking to me as well. It's much better. But it did destroy something. And this, again, is what a lot of people don't like. They focus on the destruction part and not on the creation part of creative capitalism. Now, if we want to think about how that has transformed the world, our world is totally unrecognizable to previous generations of human beings. For much of human history, the world did not change very much. In the last couple of hundred years, it has become unrecognizable. Angus Madison, the Danish statistician, tracked per capita income around the world. 
This is quite interesting. You'll see it's, it's flat. If you look carefully, it goes up a little bit during what's called the High Middle Ages, the growth of cities in Europe, South India, Indian Ocean trade, the Southern Sun Dynasty, big growth around the world, and then it collapses. What's called the general crisis of the 17th century in Europe, the Thirty Years' War is an example of that, 1618 to 1648, was devastating. It recovers and something amazing happens. Right here, it changes dramatically. This accelerating innovation and economic growth and rise in living standards. So I'll give you a little thought experiment. Imagine a science fiction story. George Washington, who dies right here, somehow invites Julius Caesar, who dies here, to have dinner. Julius Caesar would not find that world strange. The letter was written by hand and delivered on a piece of parchment or paper. He traveled on a horse and then on a ship powered by the wind and by human labor, then on a horse again. They had dinner by candlelight and it was served train, an iron horse. Then there's no slaves. The food is all prepared by free labor. A little bit further, they dine by electric light. He travels by airplane. And what would happen today? George Washington would send Julius Caesar a tweet, and they would have dinner by Skype. Right? They would not recognize our world. They would be totally confused. But Julius Caesar and George Washington would have recognized each other's worlds fairly well. But move forward now just a little bit. The world has been so transformed. And our lives are unrecognizable to previous generations of human beings. And as Schumpeter and others pointed out, this is the beginning of, of free market capitalism. It starts and stops, incomplete, but moving towards liberation of the world through free market capitalism. Now we can also look not just through history, but across geography and this conference that we're at here in Georgia now on measuring degrees of economic freedom. The Fraser Institute of Canada is a project, freetheworld.com. You can download all the data. It's totally transparent, very open project. They're interested in improving this metric. They try to measure the degree of economic freedom according to five key measurable components, size of government, the bigger the size of government, the less choice you have over disposition of wealth, <clears throat> but also the legal system, property rights, sound money, that means is it inflated or falling dramatically in value or, or unreliable, freedom to trade internationally, and this category of regulation, which is a lot of things, includes how difficult is it to start a business, stop a business, are prices freely negotiated, and so on. They have 24 components and 42 variables. And from this, they construct a metric around the world, each country receiving a score, and then you can rank them by what scores they have. This is done by quartiles, the top 25% down to the lowest. And then here's where it's interesting. Having done that, you can then compare that to other kind of indicators. So let's look at the first obvious one, income per capita. They take the quartiles, 25%, 25%, and so on. Well, that's pretty clear that there is a very robust connection between degree of economic freedom and your income, per capita income. Now, correlation and causation are not the same. Maybe countries become really rich and then say, let's try economic freedom. But that's fairly easy to test for. That's not what happens. Poor countries adopt good policies and become wealthier. We can look at economic growth between the most free. These are averages, by the way, of those quartiles. Now, that may not look like a lot, right, 2%. But compound that over the time, and you see economies will diverge. 20 years of an additional 2% compounded adds up to a great deal. 
It's a very substantial difference. This was an interesting and surprising outcome. We hear it said, oh, free markets, competition, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. It's a slogan, everyone says it. Well, they asked, is it true? Is there empirical support for that? What they found was surprising, that the poorest 10%, really poor people in the country, their share of total income is invariant to economic policy. Seems to be about the same. It's interesting why. It's a topic for much more discussion and investigation. About 2.5%. Doesn't seem to vary very much. But what does vary is what that income is. That's quite startling. Or to put it in more intuitive terms, if you're going to be a poor person, it's much better to be poor in Switzerland than in Swaziland. Right? Poor people in Switzerland, what does it mean to be poor in Switzerland? You don't have an iPad. Okay, my heart bleeds for the lack of an iPad. You don't have a new smartphone. You don't take fancy vacations. Okay. What does it mean to be in that poorest 10% in Swaziland? No clean water to drink. You held your daughter in your arms as she died of a disease that is easily curable elsewhere. That's the difference between being poor in Switzerland and being poor in Swaziland. And that is what free market capitalism offers, is that the poor in Switzerland live better than upper income people in those other countries. That is an accomplishment. We can look at life expectancy, so about 18 years. That gap has been shrinking a bit because medicines are easily transportable around the world. But it's still positive. That is one of the benefits of economic freedom. People are wealthier, and wealthier is healthier. They live longer lives. We can look also at political rights and civil liberties. This is a complex relationship, and this deserves a lot more study. So students who are interested in this question can look at the data and try to understand. It seems to be that the causation moves in both directions. Some countries have more political and civil freedom and have moved towards more economic freedom. Other countries initially started with more economic freedom and adopted more civil and political freedom. Now, there are some outliers in this case. We're talking about general trends. Number one is Hong Kong. Hong Kong is not a politically free country because of their relationship with mainland China. So. Or Singapore is very high in the ranking. Singapore is not really a free society overall either. It's been characterized as Disneyland plus the death penalty. So it's not an ideal free open society. These are statistical outliers. The general trend is quite clear. There is a strong connection between all of these different kinds of freedom are positively connected. Now, if we want to think about this, it's because of incentives. Incentives to create wealth, to create prosperity, and it's institutions that form our incentives that we face. What we want are good institutions that will create the incentives that will induce people, encourage them to engage in positive wealth creating behavior. I'd like to give this example of what this is. Most of you will recognize that immediately. It's the Korean Peninsula. There's a little clue which says Korea there. Uh, photographed at night from a very, very tall ladder or a satellite. And then they drew in the political boundaries. That's pretty startling. And it's a very simple and easy test of different theories we are told about economic development. Some people say if you're behind, you can never catch up. This is a commonplace of discussion. Oh, they got left behind, they'll never catch up. Well. Uh, this country was desperately poor in the 1950s and early 1960s. They caught up. This is now an advanced, wealthy country, South Korea. Some people say, well, if you were a victim of colonialism, you could never become wealthier. 
this idea of the periphery and the core and so on. We hear from some neo-Marxist theorists. Well, they were all victims of colonialism. The Japanese empire was incredibly brutal, attempted to exterminate Korean culture, illegal to speak Korean, could not teach it to your children, and the Korean comfort women. These were women who were kidnapped as sex slaves of the Japanese Imperial Army. Unbelievable brutality in both North and South. And yet, the South advanced, the North did not. Some people say it's culture. Culture, that's the little bag. When you can't explain anything, you say culture. They all have Korean culture, Korean language, Korean inheritance. What's different? We all know the answer. Socialism and free market capitalism. And you get different incentives from different institutions. I was in uh, North Korea two years ago, and it's a terrible place for lots of reasons. It's very sad. It's the saddest place I've ever been in my life. Everyone is afraid all the time. But also, it's the only place I've ever been where you can turn a city off. I've never seen anyone do that. There are essentially switches where they can turn the city off because there's no electricity. The only thing that was still illuminated was the Communist Party monument, which you could see from every place. Everything else was turned off. This was in the capital city, so one could only imagine what it was like in the rural regions and in the villages. So what we need are institutions that will produce incentives to create light. And I'll conclude with one little investigation about game theory. Very simple. We're accustomed to hearing people talk about what are called zero-sum games, in which the sum of the benefits is equal to zero. That's believed by many people to be the characteristic game of human interaction. If one person benefits, someone else lost. One person got a $100 profit, someone must have made a loss of $100. Many people believe that. It's a constant in popular culture, zero-sum games. So if I were to come to Fred, for example, and take his glasses, would you hold them up, Fred? His glasses here, they're very nice glasses. Then I would have the glasses, and he would have a negative set of glasses equals zero. The total amount of wealth did not go up or down. That almost never happens, only on the blackboard, only in fantasies. Real zero-sum games never happen, or almost never. What's more common is a negative sum game, Let's put that up. in which the sum of the benefits is a negative, less than zero. So let's say I came up to Fred here, and we'll do this now, and I, I just decide to take his, cam his glasses. Right? Okay, but actually, Fred probably wouldn't just give them to me, right? No. He'd probably hit me if I tried to take them. Would you? You probably would. You're Canadian. <laughs> so, Fred would hit me if I tried to take his glasses. That would be unwise. Because I would hit him back. And Fred's hospital bills would be huge. So I would get glasses worth, oh, at least $30. Fred's a big spender. So I'd get $30 worth of glasses. But after I was done with Fred, his hospital bill would probably be $2,000, at least, because my agency would take care of it. So add $30, minus $30, minus $2,000, the sum is negative. Those are all around us. Every time someone robs you, hurts you, steals from you, it's almost certainly a negative sum game including cronyism. Cronyism is a big negative sum game. The benefits to the cronies are almost always a small fraction of the losses to the population. Cronyism is not a zero sum game. It's a negative sum game. Someone gets a little benefit at the cost of a huge burden to the population. So negative sum games are all around us. But there's another kind of game that's all around us as well under free market capitalism, 
and that's a positive sum game. In a positive sum game, the sum of the benefits is positive. Voluntary exchange, that's the case. That's why we have the double thank you. Thank you and thank you tells us that's a positive sum game. So what we need is a set of institutions that can create a positive sum society. And those institutions are free market capitalism. You can find some information here in Georgian, and if you read Russian, also in the Russian language. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm very interested in your thoughts on these questions and eager to hear what you think, particularly in a Georgian context. So thank you for your attention. Now, anyone would like to raise any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, my question is about how to distinguish uh, rule of law from uh, supremacy of law. I think this is a very important issue because the rule of law, this term became very popular among the people who have no clue what is the, the rule of law meaning at all. Because if we explain to many people, I think it's the best way to understand them what is free market and what, what is rule of law, etc. etc. You, you have very good visions about this. It's actually a very deep question because this rule of law or supremacy of law, there's another distinction in English, it's a very subtle one, rule of law, which means the law is what matters, or rule by law. And there's a very subtle distinction in these prepositions of and by. Uh, in Russia, they are increasingly creating rule by law which is to say that the ruling authority uses the law to rule you, to extract resources from you and to make you obey. The famous statement was, for my friends, everything, for my enemies, the law. So law was conceived as punishment. That's a, a statist understanding of law. But in the liberal tradition, broadly understood, Law is something very different. It's not imposed, it's not violence. It's a set of rules that enable people to cooperate. It's a very different conception of the law. So whereas the view that the law is supreme means the law comes from up here and is imposed on us. Law is about punishment and force and violence. But the kind of law needed for a free society isn't, doesn't have to do with punishment and violence as a central characteristic. It's about cooperation. Contract law, for example, there's no violence or punishment in that. People are making the law when they make a contract. That's a very important understanding. People who make contracts are creating law. People who create customs are creating law. And we see it already happening in things like eBay, electronic law, internet law. These are not generally creations of legislatures. They're people creating ways of coordinating and establishing rules and customs to govern themselves. The rule of law means that the legal system discovers the law. It doesn't create and impose it. Dictatorial rulers like to say, I represent the rule of law, I am the law, and I rule you. But that's not what rule of law means in that deeper sense. It means that even the state is governed by law. So in German, you talk about a Reichstag. It's a law-governed state. But states that say we govern by the law say they are not governed themselves by the law. They can change it whenever they want. They can adjust it to suit the interest of the ruling power. That's not rule of law. That's a lawless state, ultimately. And that's what we want, is to have the state governed by law, not for the state to govern us by law. Does that make sense? It's a subtle distinction in the language uh, that's difficult to explain. But law should be understood as horizontal relationships among persons, 
to coordinate, not something coming from the top with a big hammer, which is what rulers typically tell us is the law. Instead, law emerges from the bottom up. People create the law when they make contracts, when they engage in voluntary cooperation. The legal system should be there to adjudicate disputes. You and I may have a misunderstanding or a difference of opinion about our contract. So we go to a court. And we want the court to rule fairly in such a way that the court is not saying, oh, Gia gave money or Tom gave money to the judge and so on. Uh, it's why you need to have independent judiciary and not telephone justice. A lot of countries have telephone justice, which is the judge sees a case and calls the Ministry of Justice and says, how do I decide? And the minister says that the Jandiri wins and Palmer loses. Okay, what we want is to have a total separation of the executive branch and the legislative branch from the judicial branch of government, or alternatively, reliance on private law, which increasingly is happening in many countries as well. People go to private courts, private adjudication to resolve their disputes. So that's, it's, it's a big, big topic, but very important to pay attention to language. Dictators always say, my word is the law. We have the law. But in fact, when they say that, they're being lawless. They're acting in arbitrary ways, whereas the law is about observing the common rules that are applicable to everybody in the society. My personal observation about this, this topic is uh, uh, I was in, in Vienna uh, with my family. We arrived there in the late evening of Friday and we were hoping to have nice uh, sleep and nice walk then on Saturday. So at 6 o'clock in the morning some people came called very near to our hotel and started constructing some noisy construction for a fashion show or something in the street. And it was so noisy, we couldn't, nobody could sleep in that hotel. And I went down asking what's wrong here. And they said, we are work, just workers and something, and uh, somebody ordered us this. And I went to the hotel managers and I asked, what is here, what is this here? You could not sleep, etc. And they said, oh, it's so bad. And we will talk to somebody that uh, nobody slept there. But then the same manager t told me that, but I'm sure that they had permission for that. And I said, that, what is this permission? And I'm, I think that the permission for this kind of thing is out of this understanding of the rule of law. Why? Because the permission and right to to violate my rights there in, in the hotel. Instead of coming and negotiating that we need to construct this, maybe you move your client somewhere else to, to other hotel or other rooms or something. And they could pay for this uh, uh, disturbance or something. They just went to the municipality and got permission maybe in a much cheaper way. This is what I say that it's not rule of law. But it's supremacy of law because everything was according to the law. Nobody violated any law, but in reality, there was no rule of law there because they violated my right, and this law itself was against of the principle of the rule of law. It's, it's a small example, and it, it's what my African colleagues call uh, white people problems. Uh, when they talk about lack of rule of law, it means people come and kill everyone in your village. So they would, they would listen to this and say, well, okay, we're sorry. But, but they, would, they say, that's a white person problem. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty small one. Uh, I don't know exactly the details of this. In most cities, there's normally a, a rule you can't do it before 8 a.m. Where I live, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. And that's reasonable, eight until eight. If it's before or after, they have to get actually my permission. They don't go to the city, they have to get my permission of the neighbors. Uh, so I don't know. Austria has fairly good rule of law as, as uh, by the standards of the world. So this is a, this is a pretty small uh, example. I had in mind 
uh, not so much questions of when you can make noise, but uh, things like whether contracts will be enforced at all, or whether they're simply negated, or property is just confiscated, or the terms of the deal are changed after the fact. Those are, those are big, big, big uh, problems. Um, I'll give you a small example, though. In, at the end of the Soviet Union, I organized a conference in Budapest. Actually, this was in, yeah, it was in Budapest. Uh, for law professors, uh, how to teach law. We had professors from Great Britain, from Belgium, from Germany, and from France who talked to their counterparts on how to teach law. The Polish law professors understood law because they were still teaching Roman law. Oddly enough, although it was a Soviet-dominated system, the universities taught Roman law, so they understood. The ones from the Soviet Union, it was like talking to someone from Mars. They had no concept of what law was. And the one from Romania, I remember something really striking. And this was sad, because Romania did not have such a long experience of, of insanity. One of the British professors was discussing contract law, and the issue was how to create a clause, a section of the contract, to deal with non-performance. Very simple example. If I hire someone to build a house, and I'm going to pay 200,000 lari for this nice, beautiful house. And he agrees, and we sign a contract. But then he discovers the price of his material goes up, and he will have to pay 260,000 lari to build a house for which I pay him 200,000. He's going to make a loss, and he knows that. That would be very bad for me to insist on the house, because the quality of the house would be not very good, right? So the British lawyer asked the question of these law professors, what would you do in such a case? The correct answer was you anticipate it, you think about it, and you write into the contract a clause that allows him to escape and pay me money, 50,000 lari, for example. He might pay me 50,000 lari and say, I won't build a house, but here's 50,000 lari. That's better for both parties. He doesn't lose all that money, he loses some, and I don't have a bad house built by someone who doesn't want to build it. The Romanian answer from two Romanian law professors was, you write a new contract. And this British professor was stunned. He said, well, then it's not a contract. <laughs> it, you can't just say, well, we'll write a new one. These guys had no conception of what contracts were. And, and it's very difficult then to build this back. Fortunately, they were able to go back and reteach from old Romanian textbooks and reintroduce uh, their, their legal code. This has proved to be much more difficult in the Soviet Union because that system was wiped out for over 70 years and there was no one left alive who remembered anything else. And rebuilding that is, is a difficult procedure. So that's more related to what rule of law is, understanding about contracts. Contracts, pacta sunt servanda. Contracts will be uh, obeyed, honored, uh, <clears throat> rather than just rewritten whenever it's convenient. And that's a characteristic of the rule of law of a free society. Anything else? I'm really interested in issues that have arisen in the Georgian context. Yes? First of all, thank you for your presentation. It has been very interesting for me personally. Um, I have two follow-up questions. Uh, first of all, I'm interested to ask you about the American economic situation. I'm interested, for example, the recent bailouts that we have had in 2008. Do you think that America is currently experiencing the crony capital that you have touched on? And if you think so, what do you think are the steps that U.S. needs to take to actually go back to the free market economy. And uh, the second question I have, how would you evaluate the economic freedom in Georgia? Um, and I'm interested in your comments. What do you think is the current status of the economic freedom? ...of cronyism, unfortunately. Um, uh, it's something that grows and retreats. It's difficult to get rid of it entirely. 
I think of it in the context of cleaning my bathroom. There's always this black mold that grows in the corners of the bathtub, and I have to scrape it away. It never goes away completely. It is always coming back, but I try to scrub it and get rid of it. Now it's covered the wall, in effect. We have a very big, crony-dominated economy, and it's even become much more personal. The president himself claims the power to grant you privileges. So this new health care law, he says, oh, don't worry. I give you an exemption from it. And you, and you, but not you. This is pure arbitrary power, actually in the hands of just one man. In my opinion, this is unbearable. It's, it's, it's truly tyrannical to begin moving where one person can, can say, no, no, the law doesn't apply to you, but it applies to you, and without having to justify it to anybody. So I find it simply unbearable. It is not a disease of just the Democrats or the Republicans. Both parties are up to here in cronyism, really in a serious way. The so-called Tea Party movement, which was started, was initially started because people were angry about bailouts. That's what made them angry. They started under the Republican president, and they said, enough that we, some company gets these bailouts. They took big risks, and if it turned out well, they got huge profits for the partners. And if it turns out badly, don't worry, it goes to the taxpayers. This is, this is really repugnant. And rather than having profit and loss, we now have private profit and public loss. That is simply uh, unjust and highly inefficient. It generates excessive risk taking in the system for really obvious reasons anyone could understand. <clears throat> um, in terms of how to undo that, that's a difficult problem. Because every time you create a privilege, you create someone who has an interest in keeping it. And undoing that is not easy to, to un unravel that. To take a very simple example, uh, agriculture in the United States has a substantial degree of cronyism. Big companies like Archer Daniels Midland get gigantic subsidies uh, for ethanol production and so on. Even if you thought ethanol was a good thing to have in the fuel, you could buy it cheaply from Brazil. They produce it much cheaper because they grow sugar cane, They're far more efficient. In America, we don't allow sugar to be imported. It's restricted. Why? To benefit eight producers of cane sugar, eight, eight independent producers in Florida and Louisiana, and the producers of beet sugar, the sugar beet, which is the most stupid way to produce sugar known to man, very inefficient, in Iowa, and Illinois, and so on. <clears throat> and the consequence is a crony system that's really hard to get rid of. They have concentrated benefits, and the cost on the consumer is tiny. Every time you have a cup of tea and you put sugar into it, it costs you a, a small fraction of a penny. Nothing. You don't even know about it. But add those all up, and there's a lot of transfers, and people will lobby and spend money to get it. And these guys are smart. They support the Republicans. They support the Democrats, so long as they get their sugar subsidies. One consequence, by the way, this crony system generates distortions that create more distortions that create more distortions. Here's the one thing that happened with the sugar prices in the US being higher than in the rest of the world. So Canada, for all of their problems, this is not one of them. They actually have a free market in sugar, more or less, compared to the US. It turns out, this will shock a lot of people, it's a quite a scientific discovery, that the higher sugar price was harmful to one American industry, candy. We learned candy, that sugar is a major ingredient in candy. I mean, who knew? It was a total surprise. And the American candy producers paid about twice what Canadian candy producers produced, or paid for. So, candy factories in America closed, and then they open candy factories in Canada. And here's the thing about it, one thing, I, I'll warn you, all of you, never trust Canadians, never. Because what they're doing now is they're smuggling free market sugar into the United States in the form of candy. They're very sneaky people. So that they buy sugar at the world price, convert it into candy to trick us 
and then they smuggle it into the United States, where it's bought by American consumers. So it killed off most of the candy industry, which died quietly, but it benefited these sugar producers. Getting rid of this is really hard. So that's, that's the hard news. Getting rid of these kinds of privileges is difficult. It can be done. There are countries that have done it. There are countries that have moved dramatically in free market direction, got rid of a lot of this cronyist legislation. And as a rule, over the past 30 years, is that fair? The economic freedom numbers for the world as a whole have improved. Even if we took out the collapse of the Soviet Union, that's still true. Am I right, Fred, on that? Yeah. Let me so, just add something about what you were saying on uh, agricultural subsidies. We have them as much in Canada as you have in the United States, except for different things. So you're smuggling milk products into Canada because of our market, milk marketing wars. And we're proud of that. <laughs> and, um, it, and it goes the other way. The so by the way, we have two Canadians here, and I was poking at them in a nice way. And it also goes the other way. The Danes have mountains of butter. That are, the Danes have mountains of butter which they have to get rid of. And they put them into cookies. They are not allowed to export uh, butter to Canada or the United States, but they put them into butter cookies. That's why butter cookies are everywhere in North America. Made right in Denmark. Let, let me add one more thing to understand cronyism as a system. Um, quite often people will look at one set of economic activities and they say it's not centrally planned, so it's capitalism, it's laissez-faire. But it doesn't follow that lack of central planning makes it laissez-faire. You may have incoherent interventionism, and this is actually quite common. The state intervenes, they forbid free prices, for example. That creates distortions, shortages, or surpluses of various kinds, and another intervention comes on top of that and another, and another, and another, until you get a system that no one planned, but it is not a free market. So it's not free market or planning. You can also have unplanned interventionism, or you might call it planned chaos. And you also get, if you want to understand the interventionist and cronyous system, dynamic interaction among different segments. So I'll give you an example, and it goes back to agricultural subsidies. In the United States, prices are kept high for certain agricultural goods based on a, I think, discredited economic theory from the Great Depression. That you want to get out of the Depression by keeping the incomes of farmers high so they can buy things. This is a really dumb theory. But it was what was implemented. So we got minimum prices for agricultural products. The government agreed to buy any of it that could not be sold at that price. So we had mountains, like in Denmark, of cheese, butter, and wheat, and the like, to make sure prices don't fall. Now, no one really believes in that economic theory anymore, but we're stuck with this idiotic policy because farmers don't want to lose their, their subsidies, their minimum prices. But now we have mountains of wheat and cheese that the government purchased. What do they do with it? That's where foreign aid comes in. They send this to other countries and they say, congratulations, good for you. We're helping you by giving you free wheat, which sounds nice, right? It's a very expensive way of subsidizing Kansas wheat farmers by buying it above the market price and then sending the surplus to Ghana. The negative consequence is the government in Ghana receives free wheat, which they give out to their cronies and friends, and they make it very difficult for Ghanaian farmers to compete with them. It's difficult to compete with zero price or, or free bread, and similarly for other products. So a lot of these foreign policy initiatives are actually intricate ways of subsidizing domestic policy, uh, domestic interests. The AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act that the United States government passed for freer trade with Africa was full of cronyism, absolutely. It wasn't really a free trade agreement. Here's what it said. If you're in an African country, say Zambia 
or uh, uh, Tanzania or Mozambique. You can export uh, clothing to the United States at the preferential tariff rates, a very low tariff. But it must be made with yarn or thread from American producers. This is outrageous. It's just outrageous. It's not free trade. It's just a dirty subsidy to the American producers of cloth, who are the ones who lobbied the Congress and the administration to put that into this so-called free trade initiative. And that's another example of cronyism at work. Undoing that is difficult. And my view is it's difficult to undo piece one piece at a time. If you take each individual battle, you'll lose. You have to do them in package deals. You have to take all the special interests on at the same time. Because if you take them on one by one by one, you're going to lose every single battle. They will assemble their, their political force to defeat you. But if you present the public interest, all the taxpayers and consumers who are paying higher prices and taxes and for the subsidies and bailouts and benefits, you're more likely to win if it's a package deal than if you take these battles one by one by one. And the Georgian reforms, to come back to that, I think had success partially because of that, that they were much more sweeping and not just one by one by one. It has to do maybe partly with the personality of Kaka Bendukidze, who was that kind of guy. Um, his favorite word, I think, at least in the English language, is bullshit. Uh, just says, that's just all bullshit. And uh, I don't know what he says in Georgian, but I suspect it's equally colorful. Um, and that, that's beneficial, because you don't grapple with each individual special interest. You just said, we're going to do it for everybody. And, and I think there was an honest effort made, not always successful, not to leave any special deals for anybody. So the free trade agreements and decisions were pretty sweeping. There were some exceptions, mainly in agriculture, because that's a very difficult interest to defeat uh, in, in virtually any country. And so those remain. But most of the other things, it was done as an across-the-board measure, and I think that accounted for substantially for the success. As to where Georgia is going to go in the future, uh, that's difficult to say. It's going to depend on what uh, the current government does, uh, whether there is a rational discussion uh, rather than just dreams, <laughs> but, but actual rational discussion about uh, cause and effect and so on. And that's, uh, I'm not qualified to make a prediction about that. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, honest, open discussion will have an impact on, on the policies. And also that this cause and effect relationship will be the center of the discussion and not fantasies, um, which I think played a certain role in the last couple of years. I hope that's adequate. Anything else? All right. Well, I, I, I want to encourage you to keep in touch with New Economic School. They have all kinds of interesting projects and programs. If you speak Russian, think about the In Liberty Tochkaru uh, Summer School, which is in the Russian language, and we hold it here in Georgia. And other programs available in English as well through groups like Institute of Economic Studies Europe. They're all over Europe. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah,